welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful Tuesday morning here in California. It's an afternoon for folks on the East Coast. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll just give it a moment for the, the logging in to take place because once we start, I know there's a, there's a bit of a tech crunch that happens. So um, we'll let that go on. Thank you, everyone. I see everyone's joining in. Um, so uh, we'll get started with just a little bit of housekeeping for um, how to use the Zoom webinar platform. I know a lot of us have been doing a lot of Zoom this year, but it's good just to uh, make sure that you're familiar with um, the, the features that our particular platform uses. So um, on the Zoom webinar platform, you'll notice that there is a Q&A button. It looks like two thought bubbles smushed together. Um, it says Q&A. That is where you'll submit your questions throughout the webinar. We will have time at the end, but we will not be able to take live questions due to the size of the group. So um, everyone will be muted and, uh, and you will submit your, if you, can, if you have questions, you can submit them through that Q&A tab. Um, but we have enabled, because we do want to hear your thoughts and have you be part of the conversation, a full chat function. So you'll notice next to the Q&A, there's a little chat box that looks like just one thought bubble. And that is just an open chat where you can share your thoughts, ideas, interact with other participants, um, maybe even flag some folks who are in your group who might also be attending. Um, last but not least are one of our great features that we've added this year. You'll notice on the far right hand, there's a, a, a gray box with the CC lettering inside of it that says live transcript. That is our live closed captioning and live transcript system. So it's not perfect, but um, it will take uh, computerized uh, text notations of everything that is said today. And that text file and that transcript will also be available with the recording along with the slides and, um, and the video of this conversation. Uh, all of that will be available on uh, the Solve ME YouTube channel, which is www.youtube.com slash Solve ME. They'll also be available on our Facebook channel, which is the Solve ME CFS Initiative on Facebook. And um, you'll probably find it on the website as well. And when in doubt, you can always go back to the event website, which is www.meadvocacyweek.com. Um, so without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the director for uh, the director of advocacy and community relations for Solve MECFS Initiative. I am also the primary staff person serving the Long COVID Alliance, our partner for this amazing event coming up next week with Advocacy Week. Welcome to your remote congressional meeting training. Uh, Jesse, can you move ahead a slide, please? Uh, just a quick introduction to your panel today. Um, you will have uh, both myself and uh, Jessica Brown Clark from Solve MECFS Initiative discussing um, some uh, some tips and tricks, and of course, the most important are asks for your congressional meetings on Tuesday of next week. Also helping us with some of the finer points of what's going on in Congress and how to talk to your members and their staff. We have Stuart Chapman and Shay McCarthy from Thorn Run Partners, um, our DC team. Thank you so much, you both, for joining us. Uh, one more slide, Jesse. Wonderful. And so here's a quick look at today's agenda. Um, first up will be Stuart and Shay talking about your meetings, what to expect, best practices for when you're talking and speaking with your members of Congress and their staff, some tips and support to help you navigate. And, um, and of course, a quick note for those of you who may notice that you have a designation of team lead on your meeting uh, form. Uh, that's usually because you've identified yourself as an experienced advocate who's willing to help others. So we make sure that there's an experienced advocate willing to help others in every group, especially groups with first timers. So don't worry, you'll always be partnered up with somebody who's done this before and they'll be helping you guide. So um, we'll also be touching on what you, your responsibilities or what you can do to help your team as a team lead. Uh, next, Jesse will be taking over to speak about your tools, specifically your storytelling, walk you through the online portal if you haven't visited already, your meeting dashboard, and of course our office hours that are available for to help you one-on-one. -on -one. And last but not least, I'll be finishing up the talk with um, going through our talking points, our asks, the one sentence, the one sentence you need to make absolutely sure you say, and um, our meeting priorities for this year. So without further ado, um, let's go ahead and get it kicked off. Jesse, take it away. Or sorry, Stuart and Shay, take it away. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stuart Chapman. Uh, I, along with my colleague, Shay McCarthy, are in a lobbying firm in DC called Thorn Run Partners. We've had the very good fortune of working with Solve MECFS over the last year and a half. And we got to experience your fly-in day last year as well. 
So Shay and I have worked between us for five members of Congress. We have on that side of the Hill have done hundreds of meetings, maybe thousands. And on the other side of the Hill where we exist now and, and very similar to you, have led or been part of hundreds of meetings. So we're just gonna try to provide a few tips today on how to make um, next week successful. So one very important to, thing to remember, we are, is to remember the atmospherics of the, of the offices that you're gonna be dealing with. Congress is back in session. We're at the beginning of a new Congress still here, even in April. They are doing big, big bills. We've already done a COVID package. They are coming back into session and started yesterday in what is going to be a very intense period. They're gonna be negotiating major infrastructure legislation. And it's important to remember that when you're, when you're meeting with these offices. Um, there is a possibility, a real possibility, you will not necessarily get to meet with the member. That's okay. Staffers for these offices are essentially the life of these offices. They make policy. You may be talking to a 24-year-old or a 25-year-old, but they are making those decisions for that office, for that member of Congress, and frankly, for any of the sort of legislation that comes out of that office. Um, if you are speaking with a member, you want to uh, give them the key points and then follow up with staff if needed, whether it's that day or as we'll talk about later on. Um, be prepared for the possibility that the time of the meeting could be fluid, could start late, could end early, or it, it may get moved during the course of the day. This is just a reality. Many of you have experienced this before. We're just gonna be even more flexible online and through these virtual um, meetings as much and if not more than we would if they were in person, but we will all make it work. Shay, you want to introduce yourself? And Yeah, I appreciate it, Stuart. Shay McCarthy here, and um, I thought that was a great overview to start our presentation, Stuart. One thing that I think is so vital to take away, um, and frankly, that a lot of first-time advocates are surprised by when they lobby on Capitol Hill, is really the youth of the key staffers that are making policy decisions that are instrumental in um, whether it's the healthcare policy or other issues that um, are really running our country. And so if you get a, you know, a clean shaven 25 year old staffer, that person very well may be handling the healthcare portfolio for an incredibly influential member of Congress and be their key advisor. And so just because you're looking at someone across the Zoom camera who looks like they're young enough to be, you know, your children or grandchildren for that matter, um, you should take comfort in the fact knowing that the meetings that have been set up are with the influential people in these offices and um, your message is getting to the right people when, when connecting with these staff members. Absolutely, great point, especially on the House side. They often skew toward uh, younger. These are people writing legislation. They are making decisions for the country, no doubt about it. Um, three things to think about as you're coming into the meeting. Most, and this is even true, even especially now in a virtual environment, these meetings are being run in 15 minute increments. So you wanna go in, you wanna be brief, you wanna be brilliant, and then you wanna be done. So we wanna get right to the talking points. 25% um, to 35% of COVID patients known as long haulers are experiencing long time symptoms, check. All long haulers face job loss, disability, and a broken med medical care system. Um, it could cost, uh, from the chronic illnesses over 4 trillion in the next decade. And then third, please support the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. Please, please echo, please co-sponsor this bill, which will be introduced this month by Congressman Don Beyer. The most important thing, do not get bogged down with details. Yes, Stuart, it's, um... One of the most important things that I think we're going to touch on during this presentation is storytelling. That's going to be such an important part of um, of why, as a constituent, you're able to compel a member of Congress to care about your issue. But 
connecting that story to what the ask is, is equally important. And so making sure that you're taking an opportunity both at the front end of the meeting to outline, we're here today to ask for your support for the COVID Long Hauler Act, and we're gonna tell you why. And at the end of the meeting, we would be so grateful to have your boss's support for the COVID Long Hauler Act, sort of putting bookends on the storytelling that's gonna be the crux of your meeting is gonna be important to make everything come full circle. That's how you're connecting the dots from problems or practical issues that people around the country are facing to member of Congress and staff, this is what you can do to solve it. And, and just to underscore that, thanks to your solve team with Emily and Jesse, they will get the documents they need, this office. We will get them the information they need. But Shay's 100% right. These offices don't necessarily focus. I mean, remember, they're representing 720,000 people on the House side. They have, they have as many as 18 staffers, but usually far fewer, who are covering those 720,000 people. And they're being hit from every direction, all day long materials. What breaks through? Something local, as in you. And exactly as Shay said, that narrative, that story. This is exactly why Emily and Jesse and the whole team pair you up with your local members. That's what members of Congress will respond to. Mm -hmm. um, be nice. Sounds, sounds like a truism, but it couldn't be more true. Uh, there are, uh, these staffers are often ta times taking dozens and dozens of meetings a day. And just your intention here, it, it's not just a matter of being nice and diplomatic. This is not to be meant to be a one-off. And Emily's done a phenomenal job with this. This is meant to be a long-term relationship. Going into this office, you want to be able to go back to them in three weeks, in three months, in three years. So we want this to be, if you're meeting these staffers for the first time, and there is turnover on the Hill, obviously, um, you, want to, you want to have that relationship in such a way that even if that staffer leaves somewhere down the line, you will be able to continue that relationship with the office. That is a very, couldn't, possibly the most important slide. And Stuart, I know both you and I have been on the other side of the table meeting with constituents as staffers where you sometimes get a sense of entitlement and, you know, I'm a constituent, so you have to do this for me. Um, advocacy is an art and um, you, telling your story and being convincing and persuasive um, and charming is, uh, is, is part of the art of being effective at this. So um, it's it really, it can't be understated. And it's just, it's an important but common sense point to hit on because we've seen it happen firsthand where people maybe get a little frustrated or your, your, your meeting is running late and you feel frustrated. And, you know, the last thing you want to do is to take that out on, on the staffer, but hopefully that goes without saying, but, um, but anyway, I think it's an important point and we can move on. Exactly. Uh, meeting tips. So just to go through some of these, um, do not obviously stick to your schedule. Don't miss a scheduled meeting. And as we'll talk about in a few minutes, please um, check in and sign on at least five minutes early, not only to ensure that you're there in case the staffer comes in early, but also as I noticed last year with these meetings, it gives all of us a chance who are on the call in advance to sort of co to coordinate you know, what that call is, that is going to look like. Um, again, no call, um, no shows reflect very poorly on your organization um, to the extent that you are there. If you uh, please be on time, make sure someone is there for that meeting. Uh, cancellations and running late and Emily or Jesse may want to add more on this. But if something is going on or something's not working out as far as your timing, make sure to reach out to the advocacy associates phone number to give them notice. Do not reschedule the meeting on your own. This is being done from a centralized uh, place. Uh, and again, to echo something that Shay said earlier, you know, I can remember even after 15 years, you know, either bad scheduling experiences or issues with constituents. So don't be that person that is remembered. This is a long-term relationship. Get there, be there. Um, the meeting will be fantastic. Just, uh, just make sure it, you are there to, to begin that process. Jesse, you wanna start, with, go to the next one. Stay on message. Uh, from the opening, I introduce yourself, share your personal experiences, 
and emphasize those real world impacts on healthcare constituents in the district. Remember, your stories are the ones that matter here. Emily and Jesse and Stuart and Shay can get them, you know, all the sort of background documentation that they need, but they want to hear that those local uh, voices. And that's why you're doing the fly in day next week. Um, right from the beginning, um, for having straight in, jumping into the meeting, sharing who you are, sharing your experiences will resonate with staff and with the member. Um, speak plainly. You know, you're going to have talking points that you want to go to. If you, if you can walk out of that, if the meeting ends and that staffer or that member can remember one thing, that's phenomenal. That is a massive breakthrough. And that's the key. They'll remember your stories. They'll remember what you've said about um, your situation, but to leave them with one leave behind and Emily and Jesse and the team have done a great job of ensuring that this buyer bill is going to be introduced. And so that is the thing. We wanna give them something tangible that they can lock on to and can be invested in the cause. Um, also on, on this, um, talk about, again, the real world experiences. That's what they wanna hear about. They, that they, they want to hear from you directly. Go ahead. And one point I wanna make, Stuart, is as you're focused on getting across a message you will be armed with some talking points about the legislative background, but I would highly encourage you to stay within your comfort zone. It's kind of obvious when um, a self-advocate is faking it or loose on the details. So don't try to cite statistics that you're not fluent in. Don't try to speak to an element of the legislation that you might not know. If you get a question from staff on something that you can't answer, um, Tell them that you're gonna, you'll circle back with the team and get back to them. A staff member would much rather get a response in writing a day or two later that they know is accurate than have an advocate um, try to answer a question that they don't necessarily know the answer to in a way that kind of damages your credibility. So to maintain your credibility for difficult questions that you're not able to answer, make sure that you just politely let them know, I'm actually not sure about that. Let me circle back with our team and I know we'll be able to get back to you. Uh, and moving on, and Emily, we're mindful sort of of the time here. Uh, establishing roles, going in, uh, you know, get on the call a few minutes early. This happened several times last year. Um, some were small meetings, some were larger. Figure out with your team leader who is going to be, you know, introducing each of you. Who is the constituent? That should be the voice that be, should be the loudest voice in that conversation. Um, not everyone needs to speak. So if you don't feel you'd like to, don't feel pressure to do so. To use one of Shay's phrases there, stay within your comfort zone. Um, we do need, however, to make sure that that constituent is definitely identified on the call. A congressman, you know, Lucy is from, you know, Four Corners or a congresswoman, you know, Bill is from uh, Trinity. You know, making that connection will ensure Again, this long-term relationship, not just for you, but for the organization to have with that office. If you ever get stuck on anything on the talking point, Shay's exactly right. We can always go back with details. We can always go back with data, but use your talking points. Go back to that one sentence. Go ahead, Jesse. Uh, don't assume that staff knows too much or too little about the topic you want. I, we had some great meetings last year in which advocates said right at the beginning, do you know much about this subject? Some said, absolutely. My sister has uh, MECFS, right? And then that was, you knew where to, the leaping off point. Or someone would say, you know, this is my first week as the healthcare LA for Congressman Smith. Could you fill me in on a little bit? And so getting them up to speed, understanding your audience, very important there. Um, you can go ahead to the next one, Jesse, which I think, is the last uh, two more yep keeping uh, the relationship always offer to be that resource i can't tell you how many times we say this in meetings you know when we're walking out the door emily taylor's phenomenal at this hey um let us know what we can do solve me cfs if you have a hearing coming up if you have questions about this 
reach out to us. We can get you the expert you need. So that should be uh, an ask of the office. Please call us if, if you run into issues or you have questions, let me know how we can be helpful. Always frame the issue about how it will not only help the group and constituents, but the member. Does Congressman, if Congressman Smith ever needs uh, any help around this issue on his committee, on her committee, please let us know. Always thank them for the time, these, these staff, and, and ask them if they have need any additional uh, information before ending the conversation. And then one or two weeks after the meeting, wait just a little bit of time, but check in with that staffer, you know? And, and, and again, this is a long-term relationship. What, they will, what that staffer will put away in his or her head is that the next time they have a question around this, they will have already branded you as in a good way, as one of the, as the resource that they need to check in with. So it happened this week with uh, uh, last few weeks, uh, Emily on the committee of jurisdiction, where they reached out to her to ask her to be sort of the source on a number of things. That's exactly what you're trying to do with the individual office and the member of Congress in your neighborhood. Um, contact information. Before that call ends, Make sure, make sure if you're a constituent of that congressperson, you're forging that relationship, you want to leave your contact information. Do not say, we'll see you next year. Next time at the fly-in, next year at the fly-in, we'll see you again. No, no. Say, do you mind if I follow up in a few weeks? I'd like to just make sure that to see if you need anything. And then um, the best staff contact info from the call Sometimes you might be talking to the member and you can say, Congresswoman Herrera Butler, can you tell me, should I reach out to Emily? Should I reach out to Sam? Who should I reach out to about these issues? And having that, com having that contact, having that um umbilical cord to the office is going to be major, major, major. One last slide. And then on the team leads, you wanna call in even earlier, around 10 minutes early. You're going to, st many of you already know this because you're, you're experienced in this, in this realm. Start the meeting, make those introductions, state that one sentence. And, and I can't underscore this enough. Identify that constituent. So, so important for these offices. Um, help everyone find an opportunity to speak as a team lead. Make sure that, that everyone in that meeting, whether it's two people or even 12, that they're able to introduce themselves. Time management, watch the clock. Shay and I spend our, our lives seemingly every day sort of dealing with meetings and with clients where you have to know exactly like we are running up against 10 minutes or 12 minutes or 14 minutes. We need to get to a wrapping up point. And speaking of wrapping up, um, make sure you thank the, all of your fellow participants who've been part of that. Thank the staff, thank the member invite any sort of final input that anyone may have. And again, underscore one more time, that one sentence that they need to be left with and that needs to be conveyed to them. Shay, you have any last thoughts? No, that's perfect, Stuart. The, the last thing that I'll say in closing is we don't use that term ask as an idiom. Um, ask is the thing that you want. And so after you make your presentation, I would just remind people, try to get that feedback or that sense of commitment during this meeting. So you're gonna have 10 to 15 minutes to kind of present and make your case. And it doesn't need to be something that's applied with a lot of pressure, but after your presentation, it's totally appropriate to say, does this sound like the kind of thing that Senator Smith would be supportive of? So the ask part is potentially that opportunity where you're going to get a commitment or you're going to get a sense for what should my follow-up say? Because if they've said, I'll look into it, I need to go to my legislative director or my chief of staff above me, or let me talk to my boss about this. That way, when you follow up with them in two weeks, you know what to say. Oh, how did that conversation go with your boss? Have you had a chance to talk to them yet? Um, so what, that's the last thing that I'll really leave you with that I think is important during these meetings. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shay and, um, and Stuart. This is so important and so awesome. Um, so now we're gonna transfer over to talking about the tools that you're gonna have for these meetings. Um, and you're gonna have everything that you need to, to be set up for successful meetings. 
uh, let me figure out how to do the slides first. There we go. Uh, so the first tool you're gonna have is your story. And that honestly is the most important tool that you have. You are the expert in your experience and you're the expert in your illness. And so that's why we need you to speak to that. Uh, your stories can evoke people's emotions. Your story um, and your feelings and emotions are what spur people to take action. And that's what we need out of these meetings is action. And the power of your story can move people to create change. And that's what we, we need. Um, so one of the things that uh, you can think about this weekend and, and up until Tuesday is how you wanna present your story. Uh, we don't unfortunately have time to talk about everything that encompasses your story since these are 15 minutes, maybe even shorter, and we have a lot of people that are in these meetings. So you're going to want to think about how this affects you personally as um, a person with MECFS, as a caregiver, as a person with long COVID, whatever your story is, you want to present that to the person you're speaking with and use specific examples. Um, so specific examples on how MECFS or long COVID has impacted you and how these specific issues that we're talking about have impacted you. Um, so a few examples that you could use are how has a delayed or misdiagnosis impacted your health? What are the financial impacts on you and your family? That can be a hard conversation, um, but that economic impact can be really important to people you're talking to, to, to understand what's going on. Um, another one is how has this affected your family and your relationships? Um, you know, if you're a caregiver talking about it, um, talking about, about your family and the things that you're going through. Um, and then what does research or medical education mean to your day-to-day -day life? Uh, so if um, your doctor knows more about long COVID or if your doctor knows more about MECFS, how would that impact your life day-to-day? -day? What does this research actually mean for patients? Um, one tool that you can use when you're thinking about telling your story is a framework. And one of those frameworks is a value, a problem, a solution, and an action. Um, so if you have the energy, you can even write it down ahead of time to make sure that uh, you mention the points that you want to when you're in the meeting. Um, so you can talk about your three sentence story, uh, when you got sick, how long you've been sick, and what a specific example of you being sick is, uh, a problem that you want them to solve the solution that you believe in, which is our, our bill, the thing that you want them to co-sign, um, the action you want them to take, uh, how that action did, would, or could have helped you. If those things um, on the talking points that we're gonna talk about talk it later um, have impacted you before, mention that, mention how useful that's been. Or if it hasn't, talk about how that would have made a change in your life. And then repeat that action, repeat what you want them to do, leave them with something they can take action on after you tell them your story. We wanna make a focus on a few key things. That emotional and human connection is really the most important thing. Like Stuart and Shay said, um, that's what they're gonna remember after these meetings. They have so many meetings in a day. So they're really going to remember you, your personal connection, that story that you told them. That's more important than any statistic that we can bring into there. Um, the shared experience with others suffering complex chronic illnesses. We have a big group this year. We have over 800 people participating in Advocacy Day and everyone brings their 900. own stories. 900, 900, 900, 900 now. Um, and that is a, a lot of diverse experiences. And we don't all share the same problems and the same experiences, but we do share the same concerns, a few of the same concerns, and that's what we're coming in together. Um, I would use a, a sports metaphor, but I know anything about sorts. So think of like the Avengers. Um, you know, we all have our different concerns and our different illnesses, EMECFS, long COVID, dysautonomia, but we're coming together as, as the Avengers for this one key thing. And that's what we wanna focus on for this advocacy day. Um, and that thing is the post-viral implications, um, the what's going on with long COVID, how that impacts MECFS, dysautonomia, that's what we're talking about. Um, and that brings us to the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act, which is the thing we're talking about, the need for data-driven policy solutions um, and how this will help you and others like you. Um, you know, keep in mind that 
for every one of the 900 people that are going to be in those meetings, there are thousands of people who weren't able to um, because they're too sick to be there. So we have to represent the people who can't be in that room as well. Um, so, you know, think about that also when you're sharing your story and that that story um, is other people's story as well and um, the need for action now. They need to take action on this now um, so we can prevent this happening for people in the future and so we can um, help people who are on this illness journey. Um, so there's some things to not worry about. There's a lot of things to keep in mind, but uh, don't worry about the numbers and the details. Um, you know, we are giving them this material ahead of time and you can refer to your materials. You don't have to memorize those things and we can always follow up with them afterwards. So focus on your story, your experiences. Um, you know, don't focus on or don't worry about the challenges that this act doesn't fix. We know that this is not enough. We know that this is a stepping stone and there are so many more problems out there that we need to solve, um, but this is, this is the thing that will get us there. Um, so this is what we're focusing on. Um, don't focus on the definitions or the acronyms. Uh, there are so many acronyms out there. Um, if, if you get close enough, if you speak to generalities, that's, that's perfect. Um, don't worry about saying everything. These meetings are going to go fast, especially if you have a lot of people in your group. Everyone is going to want to share a piece of it. So don't feel like you have to say everything. There are other people in your group, and this is also a continuing conversation. Um, so start with what's most important to you in case you run out of time. Um, so start with the main points, your one sentence and your story. Um, don't worry about the other issues. Like I said, uh, stop the long haul is our focus this year. Um, pass and fund the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act and plugging the gaps in post, post viral healthcare delivery. Um, we know that there are so many issues that inspire and drive us all, um, but today and Tuesday is gonna be about post viral illness and that's what's so important right now. Um, and lastly, I just want to say um, that it's important to take care of yourself when you're sharing these stories. These stories that you're giving um, on Tuesday are, are a gift. You're, you're sharing your time and you're also sharing your story. Um, and you're only sharing part of your story. We know that this is not everything, especially since it's going to be such a um, small amount of time that you have. So honor that this isn't the whole story. Um, you, you know, you might have to cut out pieces that really are important to you, but that you don't have time to. And and, you know, and that's, that's hard, but, you know, honor that, that what you share on Tuesday is not everything. Um, so make a plan, make a plan ahead of time. So when, after you share your story, after you, um, you know, went through the rush of talking to your member and you're really excited and everything, you want to take care of yourself. So, you know, take time to write down your steps of how are you going to take care of yourself before, um, you know, making sure that you have a plan so you feel comfortable in those meetings, you feel prepared. Um, how are you going to take care of yourself during? Make sure that you're in a um, area where you feel comfortable. If you need to lie down, take the meeting lying down. If you need to have the lights off, make sure you have the lights off. Make sure that you are in an area where you feel comfortable and um, are able to participate into the meeting um, to the best of your ability. Um, and how are you going to take care of yourself after? Um, that is both physically and, um, and mentally and emotionally. Um, you know, if sharing your story is hard for you, or if this is your first time sharing your story, you might want to have a friend that's um, kind of in the wings waiting to get your text or, or get your call to talk through your feelings that come up from sharing your story. Um, you may wanna have your favorite tea available right next to you after your meeting, um, or you may need to clear your schedule to, to um, you know, mitigate in case you have a crash um, after having a meeting. Um, so, so have those things um, ahead of you planned so you can take care of yourself after you have those meetings. All right, so that is the piece about um, sharing your story. We are gonna talk about that again and again because that is so important. And we're also gonna share time um, later in the week that if you want to talk through your story or do some role play on sharing your story, um, we can get into that. But I do want to share our online portal. Um, so your online portal will have everything that you need um, for your meetings. So I am going to share my screen so we can go through what it looks like on my portal. All right. Now, Emily, can you see my screen? I want to make sure first. Yes, I can see your All meeting right. dashboard. 
Perfect. Okay, so this is your dashboard. You would have gotten an email uh, from us with a link, and you're also going to get another one on Friday. That Friday link will be your final schedule. Um, you may have logged in already. If you have, fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, you know being ahead of the game. Um, but these these meetings right now are still in flux. We're still working on getting more meetings and getting um, volunteers into their groups. So you might see this change a little bit. But on Friday, you'll get your your full schedule. Um, so as you see, I've logged in here and I see my meetings that I have for that day. Everything is on Tuesday, April 20th. Um, and then all times are Eastern time zones. That's important to keep in mind. If you are in another time zone, these don't change automatically. All these are Eastern time zones. So if you need help uh, figuring out what time zone um, yours is, let us know and we can kind of help you with some websites to change that. Um, but yeah, important to note that these are Eastern time zones. Um, so you have up here home, that's where we are now, your meetings, that's these right here. You have legislators. Let's see, my internet is a little bit slow, so you're going to have to bear with me. Um, these are all the legislators that you're going to be talking to. You have your messages. These are messages that you can send um, people in your groups. Um, so see, I have a uh, message that Emily sent me earlier. That's from the directory. These are the advocates that are, are talking with us. So if you have a particular person you want to message, you can go the, to the directory and click their name and send them a message on this platform. And I'll wait for it to load. Hmm. Seeing as we have 900 people, it is taking a while for that to load. So maybe I'll just go back home and we'll we'll go. Yes, that, with that 900 way. people, our loading times <laughs> are a little slower. Thank you for being patient. Almost there. And that is a good note to log into this early. Don't, you know, if you, if I have my meeting at 9 a.m., I'm not going to wait till 8.59 to log in because it might take a little bit of time, especially because everyone's going to be on this at the same time. So log in early, make sure you're comfortable with it. Make sure you click around and are familiar before your meeting. Um, so we are going to go ahead and click on my first meeting and see what tools we have there as it loads. Okay, so here is everything I need for my meeting with Senator John Boozman. Um, so I have right here the name, the picture of the Senator, and then who I'm meeting with. Um, this might not be Senator Boozman. This might be, you know, a staffer and it'll have that information there. And the meeting lead. Um, that's the person who is going to be um, the lead advocate for these meetings. Um, the join online meeting button, that is what you're going to want to click five minutes before your meeting starts. Don't click it before then, um, but click that five minutes before your meeting starts and that will bring you to the meeting that you have. Um, different plat different meetings are going to have different platforms. Some of them are going to have this online meeting button, which is a Zoom link. And then also, if you don't use Zoom, you can also use this dial-in number and this dial-in code. Either way, you wanna join that five minutes before your meeting. Some other meetings will just have a phone number. If they just have the phone number, you can join either from your cell or your landline, and you're gonna to wanna to do that five minutes before the meeting starts. Again, this meeting is in Eastern time. When you do get to this platform, you can go ahead and check in to let people know that you're you're ready to join your meeting. You can do that as soon as you log in. Um, this is your talking points. Emily's going to go over these talking points later, but this is just kind of your cheat sheet for the information that you want to hit at your meeting, the things you want to say over and over again, um, and some additional information. So if they ask any questions, you can look at that, see if it's there. If not, say that we'll get back to them later. These documents are things that the members will have beforehand, but also things that are key um, for our asks that day. Um, so you can go ahead and look at them ahead of time and familiarize yourself with them. Don't feel like you have to memorize it, but just be aware of them and look at them and see how they pertain to your story. Anything that jumps out to you that pertains to your personal experience, you're gonna wanna highlight. Um, so if you click on one of them, it will take you to the document. This first one is the 
information about the Long Haulers Act. So this is really the most important document. Um, really look over this and read this and see how it pertains to your story and, um, and information about the uh, COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. These other things are additional information that Emily will cover, but if you click on them, they will bring you to another page with that information. And if you want to, you can print them off. If it's um, a little bit too much information to all have on this one screen, you can print that off and have to the side of you to refer to during the meeting. These attendees are the ones who are gonna be with you in your meeting. Now these are going to change up until Friday. So don't be surprised or concerned if you see some of these names change. And this star right here is the meeting lead. Um, the person who's the, the meeting lead for that. So if you have any questions, you can message them right here. Um, and this, this button will bring you to a message where you can just say hi. I won't send that yet because I don't want to uh, confuse that person. Um, but yeah, so that's your, your attendees that are going to be in that group with you. So during the meeting itself, you're going to want to do a few things. You can take notes here. Um, any notes that you have during the meeting, any um, important insights that you have or questions that you have, make sure you click save or, it, or you'll lose your work. So it will not automatically save, make sure you click save. Um, you're gonna wanna note whether the member attended or a staff attended. You can click one of those buttons here. Um, and then after your meeting, you're going to want to do a meeting report form. This gives us information that we need to follow up with that member. Um, you know, tell us how it did, who you met with, how you felt about it, all that kind of information. Make sure you fill that out. It really will help us a lot when it comes to follow up. Um, and make sure you click submit answers. It won't save automatically. Um, then also you're going to want to send a thank you note. Um, you know, the thank you notes are so important to make sure that that meeting really solidifies in the member or the staff's mind. Um, so clicking this button will take you to an email to send them a thank you. You can either copy it into your email or you can click this and it'll automatically do it. Um, and then you can also use these buttons right here to tweet a thank you, um, use Facebook or LinkedIn um, to, to share your experience with this member. So we definitely encourage you to do that as well. Um, so yeah, that's basically everything you need for that meeting. Um, you can also get these documents right here in this folder, the documents folder. Um, so you can look at that anytime to familiarize yourself with that information. Um, and if you need any help at any time, you obviously can always email us or you can click the support button here and that'll take you to um, something if you're having issue with the portal itself. Um, so looks like right here, I just got a message. So this is my notification. So if you get a message from another advocate um, in this message category. So I'm gonna look at my notifications here. And Emily messaged me. So if Emily was in my meeting, um, I could just message her like, thanks, will you mention this bill or this talking point? So you can talk back and forth from that. So that is a great tool to use during the meeting itself. Um, and then again, if you need assistance immediately, you can call this number and, and someone will be there to help you. Um, so great, Emily, did I miss anything in terms of the, the portal? I wanna make sure I got all the buttons done. <laughs> Uh, I, I think you got all of the big uh, elements. Of course, there's always the office hours for folks. If they yes. uh, need additional support, we can one-on-one -on -one with Zoom uh, help you navigate. Um, but we're really excited about our, uh, our online platform this year. Um, again, if uh, one thing that would also be helpful uh, is if you know you're going to make your meeting and the time and date is good for you, you can hit that check-in uh, before your five-minute call. Mm -hmm. That just helps us measure who's going to be in so we can fill in gaps. If one meeting is not having enough people, we can get extra advocates to come and help out there. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And um, make sure, you know, I would, after this meeting today, I would encourage you to check your email to make sure you got that portal link. Um, if you didn't get that link, you can go to um, this website and we'll send this out to everybody afterwards and prompt it to send you another link um, to make sure you get that. No password is needed. You just need to click that send me a sign in link button. Um, and if you, again, if you need any help um, navigating that or finding that um, document, we are here to help you. Um, so we, this is your support team. Um, Emily and I both here can help you with that. And then also we're having office hours this year, of course, virtually on Zoom as everything else is. Um, so these are the, the hours for our office hours. 
hours. So if you want one-on-one um, -on -one help navigating that platform, or if you want to maybe role play your story, um, we can pretend to be a, um, a member of Congress and you can tell your story to us or you can meet with other advocates, um, meet with your, your teams. We really encourage you to stop by at one of these office hours. Um, we have for Spoonies, Families and Friends at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific on Wednesday, for Team Leads at 4 p.m. Pacific on Wednesday. On Thursday, for Long COVID individuals, we have it at 11 a.m. And then um, Team Leads again at 4 p.m. And then we have a um, social hour happy hour at 4 p.m. on Friday. Now those are suggested so because we want to make sure that people um, are able to meet with people who have similar experiences, but you feel free to join whichever time works for your schedule. Um, either Emily or I will be there and other uh, experienced advocates will be there and any question you have, any one-on-one -on -one, um, chat you want to do, please, please feel free to join those. Um, whatever works for your schedule, they'll usually be about an hour or long. Um, so join whenever you're free. Um, and uh, we can connect with you that way. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Right. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Jesse, for that really robust summary of all of the tools that you have available for um, for your meetings. Um, again, um, these slides will be available. This recording will be available on both YouTube, youtube.com slash solve CFS, our Facebook page, solve CFS initiative, and of course, the, the website for the entire event, www.meadvocacyweek.com. So um, we're going to dive right in. If I get the next slides, please, Jesse. Um, I, I've been noticing all the questions in the chat about, um, about whether or not we are talking about MECFS this year and whether or not we're still advocating for MECFS. And I have to say, after all these years with all of this work, I you, you really think I'd let you down, guys? Come on. My mom is still sick. I'm not abandoning any of these issues. Um, we're just taking advantage of the change in the political environment to evolve our messaging to be get results. It's always about get results. So um, so I just want to, to reassure those folks who are seeming concerned that MECFS is not being addressed. As we know, all of these complex chronic illnesses need the same support. So I love Jesse's idea about the Avengers. We're stronger together. Just because you have Iron Man doesn't mean Black Widow isn't still awesome. And she's also in the mix. So um, again, the one sentence uh, that you need to come back to, and we repeat this many times, is please support the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. If you one more click, I think there's a little animation too for the quotes. <laughs> there we go. Um, so that is our one sentence and that is our key ask this year. The COVID-19 Long Haulers Act that I saw some people uh, expressing concern, it is not the same bill that was introduced in 2020. I also saw questions in the chat regarding HR 7057. Again, we're in a new congressional session as of 20, the end of 2020. Um, the previous congressional session, the 116th Congress is gone. We had new elections. Everyone comes back. So we're now in the 117th Congress. So we are working with Representative Byer directly to help him rewrite the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act from 2020 and reintroduce it this month uh, in its new form. And again, its new form, as you can see the bill summary that Jesse shared in your um, in your uh, your uh, online tool portal, um, you can access it there. And that is the primary document we will be leaving behind with staff. Uh, ready for the next slide. So um, to talk a little bit through the talking points, again, I also saw a lot of these questions in the chat. Um, so the, the uh, specifically about citing our sources, uh, I, I love that you guys keep us honest and put a lot of pressure on us to make sure we have that accessible to you. So um, to get to the specific talking points and the, where these sources come from, um, an estimated 25%, 25 to 35% of COVID, uh, so COVID patients known as long haulers or the overall phenomena known as long COVID um, is this long-term effect after COVID-19 infections. Um, there's a lot of amazing studies that have come out that show that the top three symptoms experienced by long haulers are fatigue, post-exertional malaise and brain fog, which as you know, are the top three symptoms in MECFS. While there are definitely and definitively cases of people getting MECFS as a result of their COVID-19 infective infection, it is um, not all folks. It still, um, it still needs to be understood, but we really feel that we can use the, the research going into why some long haulers are experiencing MECFS like symptoms, why some long haulers are experiencing POTS, why some long haulers are experiencing mast cell activation, 
all of these diseases were very overlapping even before COVID happened. So it really is an opportunity to peel the onion, if you will, and understand scientifically what are these mechanisms in the body that are causing these long-term chronic symptoms. Um, I also wanna add that um, the patient preferred term, just like in our community, our patient preferred term is ME. Um, we use ME-CFS because it's the term that the government uses. Um, just like that, we want to be respectful to our friends in the long COVID community who may or may not have a form of ME-CFS. We don't know yet. Um, their patient preferred term is long COVID. Uh, likewise, the NIH or government term is post-acute sequelae, <coughs> sequelae of COVID-19 or PASC. Um, so just letting you know the differences in the terms there and why we're using the terms that way. Um, just to be clear, just like ME-CFS and um, the other complex chronic illnesses that are post-viral in nature, long COVID impacts all ages, races, and sex, uh, regardless of initial infection severity. I will add there is some preliminary data that still needs to be verified that indicates that, again, like ME-CFS, long COVID tends to impact women more significantly. But until those studies are replicated, I wouldn't feel comfortable with sharing that information until we know more. Um, but you can say definitively, and we do know, that ME-CFS does impact women more significantly um, in a four to one ratio uh, compared to male patients. Um, this next statistic and this next quote, long COVID may cost the econ US economy $4 trillion over the next decade. This down here is the exact quote um, that was said um, in an interview with Ovid Amate by Dr. Anthony Komarov. Um, you can see the link to the YouTube video right there. It starts at the point where the quote begins if you want to double check our work. Um, and, the direct, and the quote reads, the direct and indirect economic costs to the U.S. economy from just the chronic illnesses that follow COVID are going to range over $4 trillion in the next decade. Um, so that is a, a staggering, staggering statistic. There's another great quote that we can also um, share out with folks that it, this is a good alternative, also by Dr. Tony Komaroff in an opinion piece from Frontiers in Medicine um, that he uh, authored on behalf of the U.S. Clinicians Coalition for ME-CFS, co-authored with, um, with Dr. Cindy Bateman um, from, from Utah and the Bateman Horn Center. And this quote says, that uh, that according, assuming that we reach 25 million cases, which we have, the basic numbers suggest that we will have a doubling of the US ME-CFS population, a doubling of the US ME-CFS population, let me say that again, uh, in the next uh, 18 months. So again, um, there is a, a very clear, both scientific and um, an anecdotal connection between ME-CFS and long COVID. We're hearing from long COVID patients every day as they are now beginning the same journey that many of you began when you first got that virus or you first had that, uh, that initial symptom onset. Um, and so I understand your frustration that you don't wanna be lost in the conversation, but at the same time, there's a lot of people who are going through just what we went through, just what you went through, and we don't wanna leave them behind. And if we can work together to get outcomes that improve for everybody, then it's in our best interest. Um, we are the Avengers. We are stronger together. Um, so the next set, series of talking points um, drill into a little bit of sort of the way we're structuring our case. Um, so as you know, the first thing that a member of Congress will likely say when you raise this issue will be, well, didn't we just give you $1.25 billion? Aren't you done now? Don't, don't we need to be that, that? We don't need anything else. Um, so we're gonna cut that immediately by going to talking point three, which says, thank you for helping to provide $1.25 billion to the National Institutes of Health to research the long-term effects of COVID-19. And then this section four, or bullet point four, but NIH research alone cannot meet this hidden wave, this need of long COVID and post-viral illnesses. People are suffering now, so we need additional action beyond just NIH research. We all know NIH is very slow. NIH is going to take years, maybe decades, before all that funding is distributed, then more years before all of those studies are conducted, before more years before they're reviewed and published, more years before the FDA reviews and approves that. So we're talking at least five to seven years before anything tangible can really come out of the NIH initiative. But that doesn't mean there's things that Congress can't do now to really mitigate this crisis, improve, as you see, education, comprehensive care, and treatment equity. Those are the three things that we address in uh, the, the new rewritten COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. Um, just a quick, uh, speaking of uh, if you get any questions responding from the member or from the member or from their staff, 
Um, if you get questions specifically about NIH, something like what about NIH is this, or how can we prioritize that, or isn't NIH doing X, refer them to this item in your handout. It's the the second, no, the, sorry, the third item in your handout. Um, it's titled February 25th, Long COVID Alliance Recommendations to NIH. It is a five-page letter that simply outlines all of the research priorities, including those for MECFS, suggested studies that we think are going to really help launch uh, post-viral illness research into the next century. Um, and so just refer them to that letter if they have those questions about the NIH specifics. And again, if you uh, don't get bogged down by trying to answer them, if you're out of your comfort zone, worst comes the worst, just write down the question in your notes and make sure to flag it for our team and we'll do our best to get back to all of the questions from staff. Uh, next slide, please. All right, just once again, if you ever get stuck, if there's if they're asking you about NIH, you don't know what to do, they're asking you about bill numbers you don't understand, if you ever get stuck, just go back to the one sentence, please support the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. And in some cases in the House, please co-sponsor the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. Uh, next slide, please, Jesse. Um, so I'm going to discuss a little bit because I can already see, see the questions popping up. What does the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act do and why do we care? Um, so first, it's going to be introduced by Representative Don Byer shortly. As I said, we are working with his team directly to help repolish the bill into an, uh, the areas that we think will be most effective to improving outcomes for patients. Uh, there's three Yes, three sections of the bill that are that are actual sections, and there's the one section at the top that says title. Um, so there's four total sections, um, or, uh, and so those sections are broken down into these following areas. First is thirty million dollars to the uh, PCORI, which is the Patient Centered Patient Centers Outcomes Research Institute (PCORI), and that thirty million dollars is specifically to research treatment ethic. Uh, or sorry, is it specifically to develop uh, patient registries, data banks, data, uh, data repositories, and biobanks to coalesce all of the data from all of the post-viral chronic illnesses in one place. As you've heard our chief scientific officer, Dr. Sadie Whitaker, talk about before, we have the big data dream. We think that if we can combine all of this information from other diseases, from other MECFS studies, bring it all in the same place, start synergizing it together, we can really accelerate outcomes by pooling our common resources. So that is one of the areas funded by the first section through PCORI. The second section, it goes to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, another $30 million. And this is specifically to research treatment efficacy, healthcare delivery, and disparities for post-viral illnesses. And I wanna be clear, we have written into the bill very specific terminology using the terms post-infectious and post-viral illnesses and specifically state mass cell activation, MECFS, dysautonomia, and POTS as the three areas that overlap in this space. Um, and so all of them are specifically called out in the bill as these are areas that need to be included. Um, so that additional $30 million doesn't just look at treatment, treatment delivery and treatment efficacy for long haulers, but it'll be using other post-viral patients like our existing MECFS population, our existing POTS population as comparison groups so that we're learning about everybody holistically because can't study everybody in a vacuum, right? You always need a control group. Um, so we're really hoping to leverage that for um, the AHRQ studies. There's also a small segment in there for CMS that expands the current chronic illness tracking database to include MECFS and their post-viral diseases, which it currently doesn't, and long COVID. Um, and also uh, there's an element in there that, um, that includes the, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, that includes access to care. So it studies whether or not people of color, people in low income, women, other groups, uh, veterans, elderly or disabled have trouble accessing services. And it provides instructions to the HRQ to write recommendations to improve these systems and eliminate those, uh, those barriers and disparities. Um, the last component uh, is another $30 million, we kind of went to the 30, 30, 30 area, um, uh, is specifically to CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and it uh, funds two medical education, or two programs, one medical education and one public education, specifically about uh, informing folks of symptoms, of, uh, of treatment options, 
And last but not least, again, it's spelled out in the bill, related post-viral illnesses. So MECFS and POTS and MCAS are specifically highlighted as the three other related post-viral illnesses that need to be included in this nationwide medical education and public education program. So uh, again, uh, I appreciate your, all, your advocacy in making sure that your MECFS issues are front and center. I assure you they are. All of our community has come together in, in the United uh, Avengers way to, uh, to build this bill around all of our commonalities, medical education, disparities in efficacy and treatment access, and of course, data harmonization. Um, the last point I will add is one of the most common questions folks will get when you tell them I'm asking you to support a bill is, how much does it cost? Um, so if asked, but please don't say this in advance, but if asked, the price tag for the bill is currently about 95 million. Next slide, please, Jesse. And again, if you get stuck or if anything uh, is out of your comfort zone, always came back to the one sentence. And here's some three different ways to present that in case you're sitting bored of saying it the same way over and over. So obviously the first way is uh, please support the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. Um, for people in the house, it can be please co-sponsor the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act. Can we count on you to support and help pass the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act? And of course, last but not least, will you speak to Representative Beyer about the COVID-19 Long Haulers Act? Again, he will be introducing, we're working with him on the final language, uh, hopefully this month. Uh, Jesse, next slide, please. Oh yeah, all of the, the quotes, <laughs> sorry. Um, so for those of you who are asking for an MECFS only and specific ask, that is also included. This is a secondary ask, and this is a one that's a little bit more advanced. So I say for the veterans. Um, so specifically, Representatives Zoe Lofgren and Anna Eshu, you may be familiar with those names since they have been our appropriations champions for MECFS for over 10 years. Um, Representatives Zoe Lofgren and Anna Eshu are circulating a sign-on letter for MECFS, which is included in your digital packet. That's the last item you see that says FY22 MECFS requests, or I think the, the title is something similar to that. That's the copy of that sign-on letter that will also be going to offices. You can add, please co-sign these important appropriations requests to continue and expand existing post-viral research programs that are already underway. Um, and uh, again, these slides are available. You, uh, you will have these um, so you can keep these in your notes. And uh, that is um, the end of our conversation. So I know there were a lot of questions. Just I, I answered over 40 before, and there's still over 70 that have come in. So I hope I answered a lot of those in discussing um, the specifics of the bill and the specifics of why we think it's a really good investment and why we're advocating for it. Um, the other thing I will just add is I had some questions about HR 7057. Um, H.R. 7057, while it was an amazing piece of legislation, was very small, very targeted, and NIH specific. So uh, Representative Raskin has been very clear that he has no intention to reintroduce H.R. 7057 this session because it was only for 15 million, and there was already 1.25 billion given to NIH for this research area. So it would pretty much be done on arrival because it's duplicating investments that have already been made, um, at, at least from Congress's perspective. Um, for those who are asking about a summary of the Long Hauler Act, um, again, it is in your, um, your meeting portals. If you go into your meeting dashboard, you'll see those three documents. They'll be listed right there. You click on them and they pop right back up. Um, and they pop up in new browser windows so that they won't interrupt your existing meeting if you're already in progress and you want to pull it up to look at some notes or, um, or for a reference. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to try and get through as many questions as I can. Uh, but I know we're already a little bit over time. Um, we can also, uh, for those of you who registered for this webinar in advance, we do have your email address on file, so we can email you back a response. Um, but if you did not register for this uh, for this webinar in advance, I highly recommend you come to our office hours with any questions we don't get to. Again, um, you'll see those in the links, and they're also linked on uh, the website, www.meadvocacyweek.com. Dot com. Um, it's one Zoom link. You just click it. You go right in. Doesn't matter which time or which office hours you go to. Um, we've tried to target the office hours for certain groups of folks who might have similar questions, but that's not a limitation. If you're not a person with long COVID, but you're only available for the long COVID office hour, come on in. We'll still be there to help you out. Um, let's see. Uh, regarding some of the questions um, with meetings. So um, first of all, uh, if you logged in already and saw in your group that your group is very large, 
I know some of them are still very large. We're working on it. We're still shuffling meetings around and making sure that experienced advocates are in every meeting. You may notice if you did register as an experienced advocate yourself that you may be in a meeting that's not your state or not your specific district. It's probably because that area didn't have an experienced advocate and your area did. So we reassigned you to an area of higher need. If you're uncomfortable with that or you would prefer to stay in your own district, simply send us an email and let us know and we'll try to find someone else to fill in that area of support. Um, also, uh, regarding some of the meeting sizes, um, we're working really hard to keep meetings at the optimal five member group size. Most of them are probably between five to seven group people, but there are some folks that are a little bit smaller, some folks that are only three to a meeting, and some folks that are much bigger. There's some meetings as big as 14. So we're doing our best to try to chop those down to size. But if you do end up in a meeting that has a lot of people in it, it's probably just because a lot of people registered. We didn't want to uh, you know, tell someone they couldn't come. Um, so if you do end up in a meeting that's one of the larger sized ones, um, you know, if you're just uh, don't want to say anything, you can always just say that one sentence, introduce yourself, and then step back, um, especially for folks with uh, with energy limitations. That's might be this is the best way to participate, especially have a lot of meetings going on. Um, and then last but not least, Jesse, I think there was one final slide that was just a reference slide. If we could share that one too. Um, oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm still trying over 80 questions. I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to get to um, to as many as possible. Um, this is a great one from Anne. Are there any ground rules for groups in the meetings, e.g. don't share your personal details about people in the state or social media? Should we only be sharing info we'd be comfortable with others in our meeting sharing publicly? That is a great question. So typically meetings, especially meetings with a member of Congress, are considered somewhat confidential. Um, you know, it's okay to ask to take a picture. In fact, if you want to take a Zoom capture of you meeting with a member of Congress, that's super fun. And it's always cool to put that in your Facebook photo. I think I have a photo of me meeting with Elizabeth Warren because I was really excited about that at the time. Um, so things like that, yes, is totally appropriate. Um, but information that people share about their stories, I would consider that confidential. This is, you know, a, this is not an internet space, um, even though we are participating on Zoom or a phone call, um, you know, some folks might share some really uh, deep, uh, you know, personal touching information and um, and that may not be appropriate for you to, to share on the internet. When in doubt, you have your messaging system, feel free to ask. Um, just send a message to the person that you're that you're concerned about Say, hey, I really like that story. Is it okay if I share it, if I don't use your name, something like that, um, you know, just when in doubt, ask them or ask us and we can happy to um, to make the connection. But I would err on the side of caution about sharing things publicly, rather than um, than 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 regretting that later, or or hurting somebody's feelings or worse comes to worse. Oh, my goodness, as though this is one thing I also want to share. Um, be gentle about sharing people's group, group names, um, specifically some folks who are receiving disability have limitations about being able to participate in work-like activities. So again, just err on the side of caution. You don't want to be the one who inadvertently or accidentally cost somebody their disability insurance um, or that would might be their main line of survival. So um, just I would say when it comes to sharing uh, other people's personal information, ask first. Um, I saw a question here about uh, when you're put in the contact of team lead, if you have a previous relationship with the member of Congress, that's really helpful. Um, thank you for that question, Brad. Um, if you do have a personal relationship with a member of Congress or staff and you are in that meeting, I highly recommend bringing it up. Uh, you can say, oh, hey, uh, you may remember I met with you last year on this issue or something like that. That's always a good thing to know so that they understand that pressure that we're not giving up. We're going to keep coming back. Um, that's always really good. However, um, when it comes to the scheduling aspects, you know, are we meeting at three o'clock? Did the meeting change? Please let that exclusively go through our scheduling team. As you've seen through your online portal and your meeting dashboard, we have a really cool high tech system this year that allows you to uh, to navigate and share all this information. But if you talk to your members of Congress or their schedulers outside of that meeting schedule, we don't know about it. Um, so it's best if you do it, let us handle the scheduling aspects so we can make sure all those elements are consistent. But in regards to policy issues or sharing your previous work with an office, that's a great point to make. Um, okay, I'm trying to go through. Uh, uh, one of the questions was, um, is this just a phone meeting? Um, yes, we are doing all of the meeting virtual this year to protect your health and the health of staffers. Um, I'll also add that um, 
Additionally, the uh, the physical space on the Capitol Hill is restricted from guests right now. Um, it used to be even with the COVID protocols that an office could meet you at the door and escort you in. But now there is no guests whatsoever after January 6th. So even if we did have the resources to meet in person, we wouldn't be allowed to. So all of these meetings are taking place either by Zoom or conference call. Some offices do not use Zoom. They only use conference call lines. So again, I urge you to check in the left-hand corner of your uh, your meeting portal and your of your meeting dashboard um, where it says the name and who you'll be meeting with. If it's a Zoom, that link will be embedded. You just click that link, it'll pop right up, nothing else to do. If it is a phone call, you will need to dial in and then put in the access code. If you're not comfortable with Zoom or would prefer not to have your camera on, that's fine. You don't have to have your camera on to participate. Um, or if you don't feel comfortable with Zoom, there is the dial-in alternative. So even if you are dialing into a Zoom call, you can still use your phone to participate. Um, okay, so I, I saw a question here from Christine. Um, in December, Congress provided 1.15 billion, uh, 1.25 billion in funding over four years to NIH to support research into the long-term consequences of COVID-19. How is this related to HR 9027? Well, first of all, HR 9027 does not exist in this session. Again, that bill was from the 116th Congress, and it's being reintroduced in new language in this Congress. So we are supporting the new rewritten COVID-19 Long Haulers Act that does not yet have a bill number because it has not yet been introduced. Um, so, uh, and, and related to how is the funding for NIH related to this bill? Well, the original bill, uh, HR 9027 that you reference here, did include funding for NIH. Obviously that would not pass now because I imagine Congress would say, we just gave you a billion dollars, you don't need any more. Um, so I think that that would be the relationship is that the bill has evolved because the situation has changed. There's new information, new funding. The pandemic is in a different place than it was then and our funding and resources are in different places than they were then. So um, again, the new rewritten version, which is the 93, 95 million version that um, we've helped the buyer team rewrite and it specifically includes the medical education, data harmonization and um, disparities and health access research components. All of those are um, in the new bill, which is in the summary, uh, which again, will be introduced. One of the reasons why uh, Representative Byer has chosen to uh, hold back on introducing the bill quite yet is one, he wanted to uh, ensure that all of the parties had a chance to review it and approve the legislation, um, which is great. And so we were really excited for the opportunity to help guide him and how to uh, invest in these programming areas. Um, the second is that he wanted to co coordinate with us. So one of the purposes of us having our advocacy day before he introduces the bill is to drum up as much support so that when he does introduce the bill, he'll have a lot of co-sponsors and it'll have a more set, larger chance of success by having a larger contingent behind it at the beginning. Um, let's see, I saw, so um, one thing I just wanna add, um, for some folks who may be a little confused um, about why you if you type in your email you're not getting a portal back it's probably because you're not registered so everyone who is registered um especially folks who registered most recently in the last you know six to eight days or so you should have received either an email from jesse or an email from myself with information about uh, advocacy week some of them were called your guide some of them were called your portal is now live but you should have been receiving those emails pretty steadily after your registration if you have not been receiving those emails or you never received a registration registration confirmation, you are not registered for advocacy day and we do not have any meetings for you. Only people who registered in advance have meetings and have access to the portals and can participate in these events. Great and make question. sure you're, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, uh, sorry. Make, make sure you're checking the email that you use to register. I know some people have a few different email addresses. Um, so make sure you're using the email that you use to sign up um, for advocacy day. Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, I see a question from Rick. Are there maybe going to still be changes as late as Monday night before Tuesday? Our, so our schedule could change the night before. Yes, unfortunately, Rick, yes, that is possible. Um, we're working with the offices to really diligently to try to finalize everything by Friday. And I'm still like kind of micromanaging some of the groups and moving bits here and there as meeting times changes and conflicts erupt. Um, but hopefully, fingers crossed, um, all of your meetings should be final finalized by end of day Friday. 
and we are sending a, a you will get a, a, a second email also from Advocacy Associates with a PDF attachment on Friday afternoon. That PDF attachment should be your final meetings. Uh, again, there, it's possible that there might be some last minute changes on Monday or Tuesday, but we're really doing everything we can to make sure that everything is locked down by Friday. Um, excellent. Oh, oh, I'm just going through some of these questions. Um, Oh my goodness, thank you for everyone's comments of Bob saying we should sign in 10 minutes early. Yes, team leads, if possible, please sign in 10 minutes early. Um, again, if your energy or meeting time allows, mainly just because uh, we wanna make sure that when our new advocates arrive, and we have a lot of new advocates this year, they're not just sitting alone in an empty void. <laughs> we would like to have, uh, we'd like to, if possible, have our new advocates have somebody experienced already on the line by the time they call in five minutes early. So if you are a team lead, which is, means you're one of those experienced advocates who signed up and volunteered to help others, um, please call in about 10 minutes early just to be a, a, a resource for our, our newbies. And I'll just also add that it's amazing how much we've grown. I got some questions in the chat about what the size is for um, for the for this meeting and it's it's intense. So by way of reference, last year was our biggest advocacy day ever. It was the fourth annual advocacy day and we had 354 participants. This year is our fifth annual advocacy day. We have 907 registered advocates as of this morning. So we have more than doubled our numbers, which is why you might be uh, noticing that the groups are a little more challenging logistically this year, but we're doing our best to make sure that everyone is um, included, that everyone has at least one meeting, and um, and that every every ex new advocate who ch checks themselves off as their first time participating has an experienced advocate in the same group to help guide them. Um, so I know we're already a little bit over time, so um, I'm just going to take this one last question, um, which I think is very interesting. Uh, could you please provide a talking point and source citation for the point you noted verbally, Emily connecting MECFS with long COVID? Um, yes, I'd be happy to share that. Again, um, a lot of that information is in this third item on, or sorry, this fourth item on your uh, on your screen here, the February 25th Long COVID Alliance recommendations uh, to NIH. A lot of that information, including a lot of source citations is in that letter. That's probably the best place to go to get that information. But if you still feel like you have questions about, a, uh, about the scientific connection between MECFS and long COVID, feel free to drop us a line and I can uh, either send you to our, ad, our research team who will inundate you with tons of studies, or I can try to give you a quick summary based on what I've learned from our research team. Um, so with that, I'm sorry, I know there was over, there was over 140 questions submitted and I know, I'm sorry, we didn't have a chance to get to all of them, but if you still have questions that were not answered, join us for the office hours. We start tomorrow. We have over, I guess it's over six hours of office hours available if you count the social event too. So um, lots of time for everyone to join, um, get that one-on-one -on -one attention you need. And again, um, my email address I'm gonna, is uh, E Taylor, E-T-A-Y at L, uh, at, uh, sorry, I'm forgetting my own name today, E-T-A-Y-L-O-R at solvecfs.org. Um, you can also ping us on Facebook. Um, we also have, for those of you who may not be aware, there is the 2021 Advocacy Day Facebook group, which um, over 400 folks have already joined. Um, so you can also communicate through, um, through that uh, area. And sorry, one last point. I know I said I'd wrap up, but um, I just wanted to also note, I got a couple questions about uh, privacy and communications. So um, we have a very strict privacy policy here at SolveME. If we have your contact information, we guard it very safely, very closely, and will not share it without your permission. So you may have noticed on the registration form this year, there was a new question that said, I give my permission to share my contact information with other group members. So if you checked yes to that, and one of your members of your group asks for your contact information, we will share it. However, um, with the messaging system, which you may have noticed is internal to the portal, none of your contact information is shared. So I recommend messaging your, each other through the messaging system. And as you saw with Jesse and I messaging each other, it's pretty instant. Um, and also um, the messages do stay and they are saved. So if you send a message to like your group leader today and they log in tomorrow, they can respond almost like an email, it'll come later. But it is inside the congressional me meeting template and the congressional dashboard, or sorry, the meeting dashboard. So, um, so you'll need to sign into that. 
And okay, that's the last one. I sorry, I will end there. So thank you all so much for joining us for this training. Um, again, we are here to help in any way possible. We have office hours, both our emails and um, all of these slides, this recording and um, and the, the transcript of our conversation will be available at www.meadvocacyweek.com. Thank you all again for your time, for your generous use of your energy, volunteering to take action on this really important issue. And i um, really excited to get some improved medical education and some improved data harmonization out by early next year. So thank you all so much and have a wonderful week. Thank you.